Our next speaker is going to touch upon a subject, a number of subjects, one of which is differentiation. What makes us different? What makes us stand out? Why people come here and not somewhere else? Why do they buy from us and not buy from somewhere, out, somewhere else? I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty just now and share with you um, some of the things that uh, my company, NS Design, think uh, make us different. We have what we call our three Bs uh, and we stand by these so much that they're printed on our wall in the office and everyone coming in every morning gets hit with the three B's um, and they are as follows be nice be great and be remembered let me very quickly take you through them be nice don't just do customer service because it's your job don't just do hospitality because somebody pays you to do it do it because you want to do it because you are genuinely nice do it because that's what's in you and that's why you're in this industry in the first place be genuinely nice be great what it doesn't say is be the best, because we can't always be the best. We can strive for it, but we can't do that every single day. What we can do every day is be great, above average, above expectation, uh, delivering more than the customer expects from us. That is being great. And the third thing, hopefully as a result of the first two, is be remembered. In a world of social media, in a world of digital, in a world of TripAdvisor and things like that, you will be remembered hopefully for the good reasons and not the bad. And if you're remembered for those reasons, that is what will differentiate you and that is why you are not the competition. Okay, our first keynote speaker of the day, Guy Crawford. Let me quickly introduce Guy. Guy is a passionate supporter of Scotland, so much so he was the first member of Global Scot to be entered into their Hall of Fame, mainly in recognition for his work in raising Scotland's profile on a global stage. Guy is now semi-retired and spends most of his time with his wife at their uh, guest house and vineyard in the south of France. And I just want to quote you from his website. Domaine de la Sanche is our home and business. We produce wine, artisan olives and olive oil. Happy days. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Please welcome Guy Crawford. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Gary and Nat for that brief introduction. Actually, I feel very much that I've come home, as you'll sort of see in some of these slides going forward. I, I was actually brought up in forests in the highlands of Scotland, and my parents owned the Park Hotel, so I'm now back in the Park Hotel. <laughs> but I'm going to talk to you a bit today about doing things differently, uh, and very much how I think you can do things a little bit differently. I, I was born in Forest, a bit about myself. My parents were owners of a very small hotel up in Forest called the Park Hotel. And my grandparents were from Nairn and used to run the Kregeliki Hotel and the Strathspey Hotel in Grantham and Spey, and then laterally Clifton House. My grandparents paternal were from Kilmarnock. And some of my first memories were coming down to Maidens and one of my first professional memories was going to Turnbury Hotel when I was working for British Transport Hotels at one of the British Opens and working one of the stands down there. I got married in 1980 to my great wife who I'm not sure how much she loves me now being semi-retired. I think she much preferred me when I was working. But she's from the island of Barrow and we've got three great children. You'll see I spent a lot of time traveling the world. Our son Sean was born in Monte Carlo now lives in Hong Kong. Our, our daughter, Samantha, born in the Bahamas, now lives in Sydney, Australia. And Rachel, our youngest, who went to university in Switzerland, we think she's in the north of Thailand trying to find herself this week. She did speak to us on Sunday. <laughs> and the only thing we ask is we ask for a POL every single, every single Sunday. And that is just proof of life that she is OK and that we do know where she is. You are right, I'm a very, very proud Global Scot. And I'm incredibly proud of this country and I'm, crowd of, I'm proud of where I'm from and the heritage of that. I was also very, very proud to be a member of the International Advisory Board for Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish First Minister. And I think I was one of the very first people to join that board who were part of tourism. 
And I really do believe that tourism and hospitality is an industry which is massively undervalued and that people should really be taking it more and more into account. And I hope that I've played some role in actually trying getting that profile up onto the stage. I'm also a very proud Clyde Cider. I worked this summer as a Global Scot, the first and only time in my life I will work for a month free of charge. Not something I recommend. But working as a Clyde Cider was a massive privilege. It really was. And sort of every single day going into work and helping in the Commonwealth Games was uh, something that I will take with me forever. It really was great, really. The uniform, not too sure, but the uh, experience was quite, quite, quite fantastic. I'm actually also very, very proud to be British. And you'll see I, I worked in uh, North Africa and I worked for the King of Morocco for four years, looking after some of his palaces and one of his hotels in Casablanca. And I had the great privilege of being the chamber with the, the president of the British Chamber of Commerce out for North Africa. And so again, I felt really proud to be actually trying to push some of the great things that this country produced and how we can produce them going forward. Professionally, it's nice to know what somebody's talking to you about. So I have been in hotels literally since I was born. Love every single day of my life and loved always going to work. And I think really very, very lucky to do that. But I just every day got up and wanted to go to work. And most people don't have that great privilege. I did. Went straight to work in the Cali in Edinburgh, in the kitchens in the Cali. I can still turn potatoes incredibly well and I make a great vegetable soup. I really, really, really do. I but worked initially there in Manchester, Vence, in the south of France, Harbour in what at that time was West Germany. Uh, 1979, I don't know if many of you will remember that, but the government just put the tax rate up for single guys. And I think I'd got fed up saying, listen, why am I spending all this money and then giving it to the uh, UK taxpayer. Not the UK government. So I went to South America. I went to work in a country called Guyana. Two weeks after I arrived uh, in the hotel that I was working in, they had Jonestown. So we became quite well known for drinking cola and sadly lots of people died out of that. But South America was a great, great, great experience. And I, I think the first time I saw how you really can do things differently, I have a great memory of that we used to have the Bone Arrow discotheque. That was in the time we had records that went round the way. And our customers, we used to have to ask them if they would leave their guns in the letter boxes outside the disco, because some of them weren't all that good in dealing with rum and used to get a little uh, happy at the disco nights. I worked for British Transport Hotels, 40 McDonald Hotels, and up until 2012, I was the chief executive for 12 years of the Jumeir Group, uh, based out of Dubai a company owned by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, a name that I knew quite well. I lived in 11 countries. My dear wife and family uh, moved with me 13 different times until we went to, back to the vineyard where we are now. Visited 96 countries, and I've sat on the university boards of a couple of universities, and the non-executive director of several companies. You're going to see in a couple of minutes a bit more about did you know, uh, but let's talk about that in a minute. The hospitality industry, I, I, I do think it's really important that people are proud of this industry. And I think that not everybody is, but if I can just say to you that one in 11 jobs in the world come from this industry, that's a big, big, big employer. 9.8% of global GDP come from this industry. And if I, again, if I could say to you, that these are big numbers. We are an, an important industry in the world. Employ 214 million people. But just as important, we build bridges. We build bridges and we actually build people's recognition of their heritage and of their culture. And not all industries do that. But Bree, before I go into too much of how do I think that people can make a difference in what they do professionally and give you some reflections and observations from my own professional life that I hope somewhere in there somebody might say, hey, sugar, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I could try that. 
somebody will say, yeah, okay, what a load of crock. Mamma mia, how on earth did he get away with that? I'm going to go back to, or moving forward, to just play you a video. It's quite long, takes about four minutes, and it goes back to the theme that I didn't know, uh, that Gary had done as well, uh, Did You Know? So it's like the goldfish now.
Well, thank you again very much. And if I could just say, for me, the serious point about that is that things are moving incredibly quickly. And I think that those businesses that are successful are those businesses that are nimble and that are quick on their feet to adapt and to do something that really is different. And if ever you wanted to read, I, I'm still one of those real old-fashioned guys, I quite like to read a book, and there's a book called Who Moved My Cheese? And it's the story of uh, change and how to adapt to change. And I would recommend anybody that wanted to read something, I think you can get it on an electronic version as well. Just now going on in some of the reflections and in some of the things that I've had experience of my whole life and that I hope may help some of the people in the room. These very much were the hallmarks that we used to have inside uh, the Jumeirah Group when I was chief executive. And we used to talk to every single member of our staff. And if you think, we were a company at the time of about a billion and a half turnover. We had 15,000 people working for us. And we were in seven different continents and in 25 hotels. Some of those quite big hotels. Uh, the Madinat was a thousand rooms. We could do a sit-down dinner for five and a half thousand people and a cocktail for 10,000, all just with our own staff. So a, a big organization. I met every single member of staff. And to me, that was really important that the only thing I said to these people, no matter where they were in the world, in Dubai, it was once every two weeks. Everywhere else in Europe, or in North America, or in China, if we were there once a quarter, I used to meet the new members of staff that had joined since I was last in that operation. And the only thing I used to say to them was, please remember these three things. I don't care I'm really about everything else. But as a company, we wanted you to greet the guests before the guests greeted you. And learning how to deal with culture, that used to read, look the guests between the eyes, greet them and say hello. Then we went into China, where it's really, really rude to look somebody in the eyes. So I had to change those words. The second one was really in everything that you do, never, ever, ever say no to a customer as your first answer, even though you know that K-N-O-W, that no, N-O, is the answer. But don't say no first time round. Try and say, if you think the answer is no, and somebody's asking you something, just say, not sure, let me see if I can uh, get an answer to that or how I can do that for you. And that really is a mindset. It makes a massive difference in the way your customers see you, and it makes a massive difference in the way that you feel about yourself. And I actually don't care which industry you're in, and even if you're just dealing as I do now, I've gone from 15,000 employees to one, and the poor guy working for me now, <laughs> he has all of my attention, I feel sorry for him every single day. But I try also, if he asks me something, never ever still to say no to him. As I said, we had about 15,000 people working for us, and they were every color of skin on God's earth, every kind of religion on God's earth, every kind of gender that could possibly exist. And we used to say to people, I don't care if you eat with a knife and fork, if you eat with your right hand, if you eat with your left hand, if you eat with chopsticks, or how you eat. But please, 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 treat that person, whoever he or she is, with respect. Everything else doesn't matter. But if you actually do that, then you create a respect within a structure and within an organization that I really think does help. I really do believe in people. And one of the things when I was the Managing Director of Heritage Hotels, that's one of the divisions inside the UK. And I think at the time we had 120 hotels I looked after in Britain. And we used to have a thing called Gemba Day. And that is that we used to close the head office and every single person in head office or in a hotel, if you were in charge, used to have to take all of your heads of departments 
and you had to drop your roll down at least two levels. And you used to have to go out and work in a customer-facing part of the business. So it didn't matter what part of the business it was, but you had to go out, and your customer could be an internal customer. So if it was an auditor, he had to go out and work somewhere doing the business of what he was auditing. And I have this great memory of the Alswater, where I went to work in the hotel that we had in Alswater. And I had just put into all of these 114 hotels cash registers, and actually into main, all of the bars. And I promise you, I really thought I was clever, because I'd found a way as to how to try to capture all of the revenue that was going into the bars. And my first job in Alswater that morning, I went to work as a waiter. And I was managing director at the time. And I had this lady who was the waitress who was looking after me. And she said to me, right, we're going to go in there and you're going to take the orders. Now, some idiot up in head office has put all of these cash registers in. That I've got to put them onto this notepad. And now I don't know how to serve the customers without asking what they'd ordered. Because beforehand, if I was taking the breakfast order, I would start off with the man in the orange suit and then work my way around the table. But I can't put that into the cash registers or into the iPads because there's no note where I could put that. And from then I learned, really, really important, don't expect technology to solve your issues. It might help you do some of them, but I promise you it won't solve them. Another one, just to remember, in Wild Wadi, when I was out in the Gulf, I could not understand. I thought this was the best job in the world. Lifeguards uniform, male, female, out there, every day, in the sun, playing in a water park. And I couldn't understand why they had the highest sickness rate of the whole company. As to why the, the sick rates inside this were so high. <coughs> so on Gemba Day in Jumeirah, I went out and I worked in the water park for a day. And I promise you, if you've been stood up in water up to your waist for our stints of a shift, it's horrid. And it really is. You learn, and we took the shift down. And I think that's the other great thing about this, is what if you do Gemba Day, with the chairman of the company out in Dubai, washed the plates inside Burj Al Arab for the day, when he was actually doing that. And again, he learned something about the value of those plates. And I learned that you can't leave people in water, and they, they normally was young people, for an hour every day. You have to maybe get in half an hour, move them around, move them somewhere else in the water park. But Gemba Day, and I actually don't care if you're running a council, or if you're running a bed and breakfast, or what you're running, or if you're running a government, the closer you can keep yourself to your customer, it really, I think, is something that is worthwhile doing and changing. I believe in clear and well-communicated objectives. And I, I saw Ralph, who looks after uh, Turnbury now, and Ralph used to work with me for the past one. I was at the hotel there, which was the Balmoral in Edinburgh at the time. And we had every single member of staff. We had a very, very clear objective at the time. We wanted to be number one in Scotland. And actually, I think it didn't even matter if you achieved the number one in Scotland. The important thing was that everybody in that hotel knew that's what we wanted to be. And I, I think there's a great story of the Kennedy Space Center, where Kennedy walked into the Space Center and asked the guy who was actually sweeping up inside the Space Center what his job was, and he said his job was to put people in the moon. And again, I, just, I really think it's important. People that work for you need to know, are your shareholders, are your stakeholders, what are your objectives? If at all possible, simple. Please, not masses of books, just a nice, simple, what is your objective and what are you trying to do? It's not always about money and budgets, and Gary's just going to show you a short video which I hope will make a point. How's it going? Roger, what's happening? Yeah, everything's good. So, first time for you in Dubai? First time here. Special place, this hotel. It's amazing. They got a, a court upstairs. Want to hit? 
Oh, yeah, a special chord? Let's go do it. Yeah, let's do that, that'd huh? That'd be a lot of fun. Nice to you as well. Strong winds. Not a good day to be uh, on the top of a building, huh? Yeah, let's see you. That's oh, okay. It's better than out in the water. Hmm. I get seasick. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I've been seasick one seven hours, so... Oh. I think you don't realize how big this hotel is because every floor is really two floors. Yeah, they got duplex all the way. So when yeah. you see it, you think, okay, it's 20 stories, you know, mm. 25 stories. And then you go in... We're still going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Would you want to do a little bungee with me? Maybe? No, thanks. No, <laughs> that, that's the last thing I want to do here. Oh, man. Oh, gotta get ready, Kim. This video of Fedra playing Agassi took down the website of our company and took down the website of the United Arab Emirates. The number of people, I was actually in New York, put BBC News on in the morning and I couldn't believe that this had come up and was part of the stories inside the BBC. Uh, that came from the idea of a lady called Mary McLaughlin, who was in our PR team, who managed to convince one of the journalists to actually do it didn't cost anything. And that's what I really say to you, it really isn't always, because most of us nowadays have got real problems with budgets. And most of us have got real problems with money, particularly my wife. It's unfair, sorry. <laughs> they, uh, but seriously, if you are creative and you work hard about being creative, you find money and you find ways about doing things and I think, I think that's really important to not always turn back and say, we don't have the funds, we don't know how to do it, and how to move that forward. Please keep an open mind and try and be creative. One of the other things that I've found that's really, really important is to understand the customer and the buying process. And I thought really hard on this slide as to whether or not I should start it with a slide of the British flag and have a flag of the United Kingdom. Because believe it or not, and I'm really certain of this, most people who visit Scotland go to England first. And I think it's really, really important to know that. I, I honestly don't know where most people who come to Ayrshire and from Arran come from. But I would imagine that a large number of them will have decided if they're overseas visitors to mix that into a visit to Europe or a visit to the United Kingdom. I think most of them will have come into an airport that maybe isn't in Ayrshire or Arran, that they will have landed somewhere else before they get here. And I think if you understand who that customer is and how he gets to you, it is becoming more and more and more important. And the buying process has just changed dramatically. Guy trained on a Whitney board. It's a Whitney board, you put your name onto somebody's slides, you put it onto a big piece of paper at reception, and that's how you knew who the customer was that was coming in. Nowadays, I think one of the earlier slides showed it, there's a horrendous percentage. When we had the Essex House Hotel that Jamera was looking after in New York, several of our competitors used to have 95% of their business came through the web. It's just an amazing number. And I remember going down to see uh, 
a presentation that was given to me by Expedia of what happens when you change price online. And okay, it was quite a big hotel, it was about 600 rooms. And we moved the price down a dollar of what we were selling live. So you're looking at a screen, took the price down a dollar, and watched the curve change. I mean, it really is amazing how fast that moves. And you have to be aware of what's going on around you. And I, it, it really is important. I also think doing things in a traditional way still has incredible value. I still think no matter how your customers have booked, if you know who that customer is, is really, really important. So inside my last company, we used to ask in smaller hotels, which in that case was anything below 100 rooms, that the general manager of the hotel or his senior person had to meet himself or herself personally, everybody staying with him. And that to me is part of that buying process. You know, it doesn't stop as soon as somebody's booked it online. That buying process continues right the way through, including after when they've left. I, again, I just think really, really important. Understand who your customers are. Understand where they're coming from. If you've got a website, do the analysis of your website. Go and look at the stats as to who's looking at and really make sure it's not you. I've got the website of the business that we've got at the south of France, and I was really proud of the number of hits that I was getting out of my local area until my daughter actually managed to point out for me it was me looking at the website that was actually <laughs> that was driving the numbers up. So you've got to be a little careful sometimes that you don't uh, sell yourself too well. Deliverable and communicate them your values, and it must reflect your history. And if there's one thing that Ayrshire and Aaron have, you've got history. But the last 12 years of my full-time professional life, I was working out in the United Arab Emirates. There were less than 40,000 people lived in Dubai. It now gets double the number of annual visitors Scotland does. And there's a museum that most visitors go and see. It's less than 20 years old, and it's a museum. Good God, you know, the... Uh, I don't know, I think coming from the train station, there's more than that in uh, this town. I think it's really important that things aren't cookie cutter, because I think the world has become too cookie, cookie cutter. You can just cut and paste almost anything. You know, really, really make it real. Culturally connected. People buy culture, and people buy more and more what culture is, and how you can actually develop that culture. Passion, I, I, I like to think of an incredible story of, uh, as I said, my wife's from the West Coast and from the Isle of Barra. And about 10 years ago, we went up the West Coast and we took the, our car over. They had quite expensive fares at the time, so I'm glad they've gone down. And we drove up the West Coast and we went and stayed in a tiny little bed and breakfast in Lewis. And I, I just one of the things I remember, I came down for breakfast in the morning, and I was running this huge hospitality company, and a little bit too bombastic, and perhaps a bit cocky. And I'd said to the lady in charge of the bed and breakfast, do you have a breakfast menu, please? And she said to me, no, no, we don't have a menu, we'll just cook you whatever you want. So if you ask us for something, if we don't have it, we'll go and get it for you for tomorrow morning. And I promise you, I went back, and I remembered going back to the Jumeirah Carlton Tower in London, and I think at the time we were charging £45 for uh, breakfast. And I remember going to the general manager and saying to him, would you please think about giving away your menus? And when your customers come down, would you learn from a lady in the Isle of Lewis what real hospitality is? Is breakfast, what would you like for your breakfast? And to me, that was a, a great experience of a lady who had a passion for what she was doing in this hospitality industry and just somebody that does something just in a nice way, but oh, boy, was she proud of it. Uh, sorry, I don't tell too much as I actually said to her, no, we're going to go out for dinner tonight. 
and there was a restaurant about three miles away, and I said, can we book a taxi to come back? He said, oh, there's no taxis here. Just drive your car, and if we've had a couple of glasses of wine, ach, it doesn't matter. Just stop the car and walk the last bit home. <laughs> so, so perhaps uh, not something I really need to say too much. Local flavour. I think food and drink is incredibly important. And I think that uh, I live in a part of the world where my wife and I will go out to a fresh market three times a week to go and buy what we eat. And I came from a land where everything was flowing in. And I think that the number of people that now travel the world, or if I tell you a story within Heritage Hotels, we used to say in every single Heritage Hotel, for breakfast, would you please make sure that your bacon is sourced locally and that your sausages are sourced locally, if possible your eggs, and your meat or your lamb or your fish, so that when a customer asks you where this is from, you kind of know. And you maybe with a bit of luck you might know the farmer that's brought the meat up or the other person that's you know, had the hens. And honestly, in this day and age where everything is so cookie cutter, you know, I don't care what it is, you could be that tiny bed and breakfast, please source locally and give your customers a chance to be uh, proud of actually what they've got. I, I love profits. Now that was the business that I was in, but I think making profits is important. I think it has to be sustainable. And I think, but people should be proud about making money. You know, and if you're not making money, go back to one of those old fashioned, not the three Ps, you know, but the profit is one of them, and product, and change something. Because to be sustainable, you have to make money, and to make money, you have to be profitable. So please be proud about making profits. Getting near the end, okay? Reports. If you've worked for, as I have, for you know, big organizations, you get piles upon piles of reports from people, most of which are from people, or a lot of which are from people covering their bahungis, because they've got a great big report. And also be really worried if it's in color, because that means that they're really trying to impress you. That it our, our, an example I got from Granada was we were only allowed as managing directors of our businesses to present one pages. Every report that we produced had to be on one page. No matter what it was, no matter for how much money it was. And I can remember going to a presentation where I was trying to get an extension put into one of the hotels in London. And the person before me was trying to get an extension of the Coronation Street, and the only reason I was reasonably confident was I had, he had one page and I had one page, because his slides would have been better than mine, they would have been in color, and everything. So just be really careful about people that give you presentations in great big binders, and please, for the rest of your lives, particularly for the youngsters that are here, somebody gives you one in color, careful, just let it set off warning bells inside your head, okay? Not really too sure what they're saying. Try and make it as simple as you can do. And if you cannot articulate in one page the message that you're trying to make, then just maybe you haven't got the right message. A few things that I'm trying to do, and one of the things I want to do there was one of my, the, the bottle of wine on the left-hand side was the protocol team when I was working out at the Commonwealth Games, I promised the, the ladies and guys that I was working with that I would actually make a bottle of wine and put a blend together this year. So I, so I can't sell it, so this is not a sales pitch, but it was just a lovely thing I did for them to say thank you, where I put the protocol team and uh, sent over here a few hundred bottles of wine to say thank you to the people that were working with me inside that. If you want to contact us, uh, a web address, Facebook, Twitter, email. Uh, thank you very much. I hope bits of that were useful. Uh, delighted to take any questions. 
And if you're in the southwest of France and you'd like to come and have a glass of wine, uh, my wife is very, very hospitable. I'm not, okay, but she'll, she'll come and do it, okay? Come and say hello and have a glass of wine. Thank you. Okay, just before the lunch period, we do have a little bit of time if any of you have any questions for Guy. Um, bit of a show of hand. Uh, Johnny, do you want to... Ah, in fact, I'll grab the mic. Can I give me that? Uh, yeah, thank you. In fact, do you want to take the stage, there. if that's yeah. all right? Are there any questions in the room for Guy? A few minutes, okay. Oh, I had to be right at the back. Keeps me fit. Thank you, Howard. Well done. Here we go. Hi, my name is Howard Wilkinson. Your Gamba Day idea is, is clearly highly laudable. To what extent did you practice the reverse of that and having people spend a day two levels up so you get reciprocity of ideas and greater empathy? Uh, truthfully, it, it wasn't something that I, I did on a consistent basis. I did, I, I used to sit on the board of the Lausanne House Health School and I used to have as one of the prizes, some prize, uh, to one of the students every year to come and spend a day with me and literally used to not change anything in my agenda. They could pick the day and then follow me around. But I, I, again, I think that could be really quite a good idea. It wasn't something I did on a regular basis apart from with those university students. Any other questions? Show hands. Anyone? One down here, thank you. And a gentleman up the back. Get running, Gary. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Moira Burt with Salon from the Ayrshire College. Hi, Moira. And, uh, hello. Uh, and I've been in sort of education, higher education and further education for the last 20 years in tourism. Uh, it pains me to think that we can't get young graduates or young people into tourism due to probably the blockers of schools and parents who don't appreciate the importance of tourism. Uh, hospitality is fine with plenty of young cooks and professional chefs coming through but the more the management side the business side do you have any tips or ideas of how we can engage with the schools and the the careers advisors i i i used to share massively the the same problem you had compounded a bit out in the gulf where some of the brightest people out in the gulf are female and getting females in the gulf into the hospitality industry was a nightmare, not for most of the time for the Gulf, but because sometimes they're families and for culture and for lots of different reasons. I think there were two things that we were trying to do as part of the world tourism body. One was to start paying people properly. And I, I remember my uh, son went to Surrey and took a degree in, I don't know, something to do with banking or something. And when he left university with a degree, earned, in my humble opinion, far too much money. And I had a daughter that went to uh, uh, University of London and took an English degree and afterwards went for a job in hospitality. Both good degrees and one got a third of the salary of the other. So I think one of the things that we have to do inside an industry is start paying people properly. And then I think it's up to people such as myself, such as yourself, of actually saying to young people nowadays, is this is a great career. And you really can be successful if you've got the right attributes and if you've got the right education. And I, I was extremely proud of the fact that inside the Jumeirah group, half of our senior general managers were female. Uh, Margaret Paul, who I, I hope is about to join the Global Scott organization. You know, Margaret runs a business, 1,000 rooms, I think we had 54 restaurants, as I said, a sit-down theater for 1,000, sorry, 5,000 people. People can be proud of this industry, and I think that internal pride in this industry will grow as more and more people talk about it. And as more and more people start to understand, I really don't care. If I, I run a tiny little, uh, I don't even do breakfast, uh, guest house in the southwest of France. But I, I really am proud of it. I, I really am. You know, the, I, I hope it's spotless. I hope everybody that comes and stays in it uh, goes away with a really great memory. Uh, and I, I think that passion and that pride of what you do, uh, it, it's a great industry for people. Uh, we just need to pay people a bit better sometimes uh, and actually get the message out there. 
one in 11 jobs in the world. I used to go out to China, and they, we had quite a lot of hotels that were out there. Uh, and I don't know, if you've ever spoken to 400 young Chinese, now young men and women that are out there in front of you and they're in tourism, they are like sponges. They just want to learn and they want to do this industry and are incredibly proud of their country. No prouder than we are, I'm sure, of the school here uh, in Ayrshire. But I just think we can up the game a little bit more. It's a great industry and I enjoy being in it. Okay, one final question. I believe there's one. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, sorry, I'll take this one at the back, which is I ran all the way here. It'd be a shame to miss you out. Ah. Hi, Guy. Uh, Peter Graham from Business Gateway in, in Ayrshire. Um, Hi, with the growth in the Asian economies, particularly uh, India and China, how big an opportunity do you think there is for inbound tourism to Europe, UK, and Scotland in particular? I, I can't remember the exact figure, but. I, I seem to remember that the number of years it takes this industry to grow is just an, an extraordinary number. You know, I think it's just quite amazing what the growth is. If I, if I could tell you that in the Gulf, when I left, there were 54 flights a day from the Gulf back to the United Kingdom. That, that's, a, that's an amazing amount. Now, a lot of that traffic is going that way, out of here. But I will guarantee you that a lot of that traffic, and more and more, is also starting to get here. You know, and these boundaries that exist in our minds are, are slowly but surely being eaten away. And I think as long as, I would go back to governments then as well, as long as governments are careful with things like passenger tax, and they don't tax the blazes out of an industry and take too much of it away, then I think that our countries such as Scotland, areas inside Scotland, Ayrshire and Arran, I think have amazing potential. People want to experience authenticity. People want to touch things that are real. Scotland's real. Ayrshire's real. You know, the, the history that's here is there. And I, I think it's up to governments to make it tax efficient. And then I think it's up to people to give a welcome everywhere you go, where you're invi invited around this industry. And then people will come back. They won't come back if you can't get here. They won't come back as, I, I can't remember what the figure was when I left, but I, I think an airline ticket, 500 pounds of the 1,000 pounds was tax. You know, so you, we need to be careful that you don't price industries out of market. Other than that, I, I think it will grow and it will grow and it will grow. If you think, I can't remember what percentage of people from China today that have a passport. Those people will travel. And those young people of today out of Shanghai, Guangzhou, or some of those areas, I promise you, that they know Scotland. I promise you that they, they will come here because it is a truly, I think if you, I, I'm the, one of the expat ones, so I'm away from here, but it's, my dad's still here. This is a great place. It really is. And I think business will continue to grow. Make it tax efficient, make it value for money. And value for money, I think can be really quite expensive. I, I took my wife for 35th wedding anniversary and we went up to, sorry it wasn't in Ayrshire now, and we went to the Three Chimneys for the night and we paid several hundred pounds for dinner and then leaving the next morning. It was a Wednesday night in the middle of February, it was bucketing, I got lost trying to find it, but I promise you it was full and it was packed. And that, I think, is because it was value for money, and that value for money can still be expensive. So I, I think just it, it, these things work. You just need to be very focused and passionate, and it'll grow. Okay. Great. Thank, you very thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.